Good morning, One Tenna Church family. Um, I did not know it was Pastor Appreciation Day today, and I think, oh, our cameras are all frozen. So we're going to give it a second, which is just as well because uh, if you can hear me, um, <laughs> I'm going to get a little bit emotional. Thank you. I know it's Pastor Appreciation Day. Um, actually, I did not know that. So thank you, Liz. Thank you, Julie, for the one, or oh, I was going to say wonderful children's story. I mean, you did say, and I quote, young, handsome, intelligent, and multi-talented. Uh, would have been nice if you said something about Dan as well, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> the audio is coming through okay. It's all right. You can hear me talk for just a few moments while we sort out the cameras. Um, I, I have the chocolates with me here, Liz, so thank you for that. Uh, Nadia will also be extremely grateful. Just give us a few more minutes to sort out the cameras. We have a new camera system in place, and it's been misbehaving all morning. So, oh, here we are. I think we're good to go. I'm just waving it out. I think we're good. I think we're good. Here are the chocolates. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to put that down before I get too distracted. Again, thank you for the kind words. Thank you, Julie, who's up there. Um, yeah, it's... We should have gone to black screen because I'm going to get emotional in a second. All right, let's get to our message for today. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you've joined us previously, welcome back. We are coming to the final quarter of 2021, if you can believe that. Now, talk about time flying these past two years. I was speaking to someone just yesterday about how we should just write off this year and last year, like, you know, like they don't count. I, I couldn't agree more. In the same way, the calories we've consumed over the last two years also don't count, right? Alan, it is declared so. Phil, you agree with me? No calories. Um, I know last year has been challenging. I know there are certainly things I, the church, all of us could have done better. But just thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. I hope I have been able to do the little that I can to encourage you and to support you as well. Now, I don't want to repeat everything that's already been highlighted, but just a reminder that in, uh, that in case you missed the Living His Love segment with um, Kaz today, we've swapped the board meeting and the town hall meeting around and basically planned in an extra board meeting, which kind of makes sense because we'll know, we'll know more closer to the time. So next Tuesday, uh, October 12th, is a board meeting, while the town hall meeting is Monday, October 18th. The details are in the newsletter. Um, thanks, Megan, for the wonderful prayer. But I like to pray, and then we will get into our message for today. Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you. And uh, Lord, I'm for this time that we can come together again. Lord, amidst the challenging times we've had, Lord, I'm grateful that I have a church family that I can call my church family. That even as we navigate these difficult, trying times, our focus and emphasis is on you, and that we can draw on your love to support and encourage each other. Lord, as we get into our message for today, my prayer remains the same, that you would hide the messenger behind the message and behind the cross of Calvary, that any and all glory goes back to you and to you alone. May you open not just our minds, may you open our hearts as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, now just a quick recap from last week's message. You know, today is effectively part two of our Daniel and Revelation series. Um, last week I said that Dan, our associate pastor, suggested that we should call this series Radical, which of course stands for Revelation and, Christ, and, Revelation and Daniel is Christ and Love. Now, some thought it was rather cheesy. Some of you actually really liked it. In fact, Dan said, you know, he wanted to make a... Now, let's make a slight amendment to this uh, original acronym. So instead of Christ and Love... It can be Christ's amazing love, and cheesy or not, it's definitely true. 
Now, the first five words of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, calls it the revelation of Jesus Christ. And yes, it is the revelation of Christ's amazing love. So all the prophecies that we study all fall under the banner and the bigger picture of pointing to who Jesus is. So today is effectively part two of our Daniel and Revelation series, but it's also the second part of what I call Prophecies Past. I mentioned that the amount of stuff we've covered last week and what we'll cover today, well, a typical, traditional, conventional Daniel Revelation seminar will require at least six presentations with at least an hour each. So that means there's a possibility that some of you watching might get, I guess, maybe a little bit lost pertaining to details, because I'm only giving you the overarching picture. Now, here's what I mean. We started with the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2. Now, what Daniel 7, 8, and 9 then goes and does is that it actually gives us more details that help us clearly identify these kingdoms. So in that second column, we've got Daniel 2. I'm going to fly through this because we covered this last week. Lion with wings, bear, four-headed leopard, um, this terrible beast, and the horn. Now, pause for a moment. So just to be clear, the little horn does not represent the divided nations. Rather, it existed around this time. So I mentioned last week, we'll come back to the little horn, but not today. And in Daniel chapter 7, the Bible talks about judgment right before God's kingdom, where it's described as an everlasting kingdom. So Daniel 7, in a nutshell, very, very quickly, Daniel 8 only mentions two animals, and of course, the 2,300-day prophecy and the cleansing of the sanctuary. And Daniel 9 goes into more specific details, but pointing only to the 70-week prophecy, which culminates in Messiah the Prince. And that's what we are going to break down today. I want to do something relatively quickly before we do that. Some of you watching this will go, how did he, you know, put all this together? Should we just take his word for it? Well, there's actually a lot to it. Uh, I'm not going to have the time to break everything down, of course, in the interest of time or lack of it. Unfortunately, I don't have a choice. It was either do it in this manner, give this big picture, or preach one chapter only and leave everything else out, or have the next half of the year dedicated to covering this. Prophecy is an exciting thing. But whatever your walk with God is, I hope that we can really pique your interest in studying further. I welcome you to talk to me about this, but I also want to put up some links and resources that I'm recommending you go to, and I'll do this for the next couple of minutes. So if you're looking for books to read, here's a few that I recommend. The links to all of these um, and where you can purchase them are in our YouTube description down below, so you don't have to worry about writing writing them down. The first one here is by Ranko Stefanovic. This is a commentary looking at the book of Revelation verse by verse. So it gets really deep. Professor Stefanovic is a very respected voice on the book of Revelation, not just in the Seventh-day Adventist church, but in other theological circles as well. He has his own YouTube channel, which he also presents in his native Yugoslav tongue, so check it out. A few other quick books in succession, Daniel, Wisdom to the Wise is a commentary, again, a verse-by-verse study by Zdravko Stefanovic, not related to Ranko. And then we have two books that are less commentary, but still pretty deep, um, and goes into some great detail, some technical stuff with Greek and Hebrew. That's uh, Revelation's Great Love Story by Larry Lichtenwalter and Secrets of Daniel by Jacques Dukan. Just flying along now, two of the easiest, in my opinion, to read books are these by Seth Pierce, Prophecies of Daniel and Revelation Made Simple. He also wrote the teens version. Check it out. If you want a more structured and free approach, you can sign up for a prophecy course at the Hope Channel. That's the URL there. It takes you through a 24-part series on the books of Daniel and Revelation. Two more links. If you would prefer to watch as opposed to read, I recommend itiswritten.com or itiswritten.tv. 
They don't cover just prophecy, but a number of other related topics uh, to do with the Christian walk. So you'll have to look through the huge list of videos that they have to find the specific prophecy, prophecy stuff. And finally... Another deep dive into the book of Revelation uh, is this YouTube channel called Revelation, Hope, Meaning, and Purpose. Now, this series was completed five years ago. All the videos are still available. Just search Revelation, Hope, Meaning, and Purpose, and you'll find it. Whew. Okay, so we have got a number of resources that I've put up that I've flown through just very, very quickly. And again, um, they will be in the YouTube description below. Just before we move on, one last thing. I want to repeat the same caution as I mentioned last week. I want you to be mindful and, I guess, uh, careful about sensationalistic claims by preachers and presenters. You know, if they're not really pointing you to Jesus... They've literally gone against the very purpose and reason of why the books of Daniel and Revelation was written. So I've seen, unfortunately, one too many presenters that spend so much more time talking about beasts and all of that than anything else. Well, are they important? Yes, I've talked about them. They're in the Bible. But sometimes I wonder, when you look through YouTube, the amount of time that people talk about the Antichrist... I wonder if they know the Antichrist better than Christ himself. <laughs> All right, moving on. The prophecies pertaining to Christ is actually incredible. We could spend a long time talking about it. Here are some of them. I'm not going to go through them in detail. I'm flying through some of these really, really quickly. You know what you could do? You could replay this YouTube video in 0.75 speed, and then you'll get everything I say, right? Um, but here, here are some of the prophecies. He was born in Bethlehem, according to Micah, which was written about 8th century BC. Um, he was born of a virgin. He was prophesied uh, and fulfilled in Matthew. Um, to, uh, the he, the prophecy talks about how the Messiah will be of David's lineage, the attempted murder by um, Herod, and a whole bunch of other things. I'm going to click through them. Um, the year, day, and hour of his death, we will talk about that today, and how he was raised the third day. There are a total of something like 125 prophecies. Now, someone much, much smarter than me decided to work on some of these prophecies. His name is Dr. Peter Stoner. Some of you have heard me mention him before. Here's a little bit about him. So he's a mathematician. He's the former chairman of the Department of Mathematics, Mathematics, Astronomy, and Engineering um, at Pasadena College, California. He worked with 6,000 students, sorry, 600 students for several years, and he applied the principle of probability to the prophecies of the Messiah's coming. So he just chose eight prophecies. Now remember, there's 100 and something like 125 prophecies, and the probability uh, increases exponentially, but he just chose eight. I don't know why he decided to do something like that, but here, the next four slides are an insight on how he did it. So I'm just going to read it. Either you get it, or like me, you probably need to read it about 10 times before you get it, if not more. So this is what he says. The prophecy predicts, this is the first prophecy, the prophecy in Micah 5 verse 2. This prophecy predicts that the Christ is to be born in Bethlehem. Since this is the first prophecy to be considered, there are no previously set restrictions. So our question is, one man in how many the world over has been born in Bethlehem? Okay, so far so good, right? He then continues, the best estimate which we can make of this comes from the attempt to find out the average population of Bethlehem from Micah down to the present time and divide it by the average population of the earth during the same period. One member of the class was an assistant in the library, so he was assigned to get this information. He reported at the next meeting that the best determination of the ratio that he could determine was 1 to 280,000. Okay? Now, 
since the population of, since the probable population of the earth has averaged less than 2 billion, the population of Bethlehem has averaged less than 7,150. Our answer may be expressed in the form that one man in 7,150 over 2 billion, or one man in 2.8 times 10 zeros, 10 to the power of 5, that's meant to the 10 to the power of 5, uh, was born in Bethlehem. If that's just gone over your head, that's okay. Like I said, someone much smarter than I. 2.8 to the power uh, of, t- uh, sorry, times 10 to the power of 5. So he would apply the same concept to eight prophecies. Nerds, man. <laughs> and this is his conclusions. The probability of eight prophecies being fulfilled in one person is literally one in, now that's 28 zeros. One in 28 zeros. I, I, think that's, I think that's incredible. So when you factor in this big picture that we talked about last week, as in this big picture here, we haven't even really begun to scratch the surface. See, the whole context of Daniel and Revelation, the ultimate goal is to point to Jesus and who he is, and most importantly, in our context, to his second coming to bring us home. But in the midst of all of that, we have to remember there is one very important prophecy that highlights his first coming of why he came here in the first place. And that's in Daniel chapter 9, so just four verses, but four very powerful verses in prophecy. I'm referring to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, also known as the 70-week prophecy. I want to set the stage, though, from Daniel 9 and verse 20 um, to 23. Daniel says, "'Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin,' And the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Verse 22 And he informed me, and talked with me, and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So, here's the background. Daniel's praying and trying to put effectively two and two together. He's trying to understand what all of this means. In fact, he's still baffled from a part of this vision in Daniel 8 that he doesn't get. So while he's praying, the angel Gabriel comes to give him understanding. Gabriel's like, all right, remember, this is coming to Daniel around 530 BC or thereabouts. God's like, yes, Daniel, people are in captivity, but I've got good news for you. Let me tell you what's going to happen in the next few hundred years. Here's the vision. Here's the prophecy. And so Gabriel starts off in Daniel 9 and verse 24 with these words. The Bible says this. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of, sorry, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to set, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. In verse 25, know therefore and understand that from this going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be, like, shall, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. 
and the end of it will be with the, shall be with the flood, and till the end of the war desolations are determined, and verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the uh, wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate." Okay, (laughs) a lot to unpack here, right? You're looking at just these four verses, this prophecy, and it's like, like, whoa, like, like what? Don't worry, we'll get there. But first, I want to squeeze all four verses into the one screen. Um, It's harder to read. In fact, I can't see it from here. But there's a reason why I want to put it all into the one screen, See, if you were Daniel, if you were listening to Gabriel proclaim this prophecy, this vision, there's kind of like one word that will stick out to you immediately. It's like, okay, yeah, 70 weeks, I will come back to that. Transgression, sins, reconciliation, prophecy, all of these big words, all of these theological words, all of these words that you and I don't use in the day-to-day context, but that one word that will capture your attention immediately especially if you were a Jew, is the word Messiah. So imagine if you're in captivity and the prophecy tells you that the Messiah is coming to deliver you. And Messiah, by the way, means anointed one. So you see the Jews thought that the Savior had come, the Savior will come. And so you can probably imagine Daniel's excitement in hearing this, the Messiah is going to come and deliver. However, as we saw from last week in chapter 10, Daniel, in fact, after hearing the whole thing, he had quite the opposite effect. He was mourning, he was fasting, he was just, I guess, overall worried about everything. And why is that? I have a feeling that while the prophecy indicates that the Messiah will come, that's certainly good news, it's all the other stuff surrounding it that he's a little concerned about. You know, going back to Daniel 9 and verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So already from Daniel's understanding that the desolation of Jerusalem was prophesied in Jeremiah, that it's going to last 70 years. And he's just been told it's going to last longer than that. In prophetic terms, 70 weeks. Now, how long is that? Biblical prophecy uh, interpretation is basically a day for a year. We see this in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, a day for each year. Um, And likewise, Numbers 14 and verse 34 says the same thing. So going back to Daniel 9 and verse 24, 70 weeks, which according to this day-year principle, we've got 490 days or 490 years. Daniel's probably thinking, 70 years is bad enough. Now we have to wait 490 years before the Messiah, before all of these things. There are big words here, as I've mentioned. Finish transgression, end of sins, make reconciliation. I'm not going to break each one of them down. We'll be here forever. Maybe it's easiest to summarize or to translate this way. God will fix everything. At the end of the 490 years, there's going to be a solution for sin. You see, for years, the Jews had a system of the sanctuary and the tabernacle that God had instructed them to carry out in order to make amends. It was designed to show that human efforts at its best, wouldn't be enough. Now, that's another story altogether, this old sacrificial system. But the point is that God told Daniel, but by the end of this 490 years, there's going to be a new system. There's going to be a change. What is happening, what you're doing right now won't work. 
We've tried it. We can say we've tried it. I've given you instructions. You've fallen on the wayside. There's going to be something that will fix this problem of sin, and it won't require the sacrifice of animals and all that. In fact, it won't require any human effort. And then going to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25, we get to see now the starting point of this 70 years. So Daniel's like, okay, 70 years, something's going to change. We need a starting point. The Bible says this, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 72 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. So the clue here is from the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's the starting point. Now, one of the challenges with Daniel 9 um, and the book of Daniel in general, and even the book of Revelation, is the poetry style in which it is written. Grammatically, it makes a lot more sense in Hebrew, so we have to break this down, uh, especially this verse, a little bit more. Here's how we can understand this clearer. So, from the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, there is a command there. And from there, we have seven weeks or 49 years. Then Jerusalem will be rebuilt. And then we have another 62 weeks or 434 years. Then Messiah, the Prince, will come. So we can do some very pretty simple, calcul pretty simple calculations now that we have the starting date uh, for the command to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. We just need to find out what this date is. Daniel, of course, didn't have the hindsight. Remember, he wrote this in like 530, 540 BC, but we do. In fact, here's a comment by someone whom I'm willing to bet, well, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I'm willing to bet that you didn't know had an interest in prophecy. Sir Isaac Newton. Yes, that very same Sir Isaac Newton. In Observations Upon the Prophecies of the Bible, pages 154 to 157, he comes to this conclusion. The years of Artaxerxes' reign are among the most easily established dates of history. The canon of Ptolemy, the Greek Olympiads, and allusions in Greek history to Persian affairs all combine to place... Oops. I should have clicked for the screen to move forward. There we go. Let me start again. Let me start again. The years of Artaxerxes' reign are among the most easily established dates of history. The canon of Ptolemy, the Greek Olympiads, and allusions in Greek history to Persian affairs all combine to place the seventh year of Artaxerxes at 457 BC. Okay? So Sir Isaac Newton says, and amongst others... The seventh year of Artaxerxes at 457 BC is the starting date. So he was not the only one who came to this conclusion, but we can be pretty confident that 457 BC is the command to, or the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And now since we have the starting point according to Daniel 9.25, we can put it all together. The decree is in 457 BC. Remember, BC is working backwards, so 457, 456, 454. And after seven weeks of 49 years, that brings us to 408 BC. The rebuilding of Jerusalem is complete. We then have another 62 weeks of 434 years. That brings us to 27 AD, where the Messiah, the Prince, comes and According to, well, Messiah, by the way, means anointed. And we know from history that Jesus was baptized around AD 27, signifying his anointing. Hence, Messiah, the prince, Jesus' baptism. See, before that, we don't know much about Jesus at all. Luke mentions his childhood with that one particular event. But his mission hadn't officially begun until AD 27, because it was also a fulfillment of prophecy. He was baptized, and he began his mission. Take a breather for a moment. It feels like I've been speaking very, very quickly. If you all were here, I would look at you, and you'd be like, yep, we're following along. I'm just going to assume that you are following along. We've got more to come, 
because the most significant of this 70-week prophecy comes from the second half of these four verses in Daniel 9, verses 26 to 27. The Bible says this, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Okay, <laughs> lots of stuff here. I'm just going to sift through the language. Now you know why I would have needed a lot more time, right? Um, but I'm just going to highlight three key parts of the prophecy here. The rest really is just what I would consider filler language. So firstly, Messiah shall be cut off, meaning he will die, okay? Secondly, he says that the Bible says that there, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. So the final week of the 70-week prophecy is significant, especially for the Jews and the sacrificial system, this covenant, because in the middle of the third week, the Messiah shall bring an end to sacrifices and offering, meaning that what happens to the Messiah signals an end to the sacrificial system. Okay? So now bringing it all together to complete the timeline, here's what we have drawn from Daniel 9 verses 24 to 25 so far. We have this one week that leads us to AD 34. History tells us that this was a time uh, a man by the name of Stephen was stoned. We can cross-reference this in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 8. But in the interest of time, we'll just read Acts chapter 8, verses 2 to 4. The Bible says this, Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You see, after AD 34, the stoning and burial of Stephen... After the end of the 70-week prophecy, that's when those who were scattered preached wherever they went. It wasn't just localized and centralized anymore, meaning the message of the gospel was now more than just for the Jews. It was for everyone. In fact, I said earlier, the covenant was confirmed for many. And in that language, in that context, it's not just to the Jews, so you and I, jumping, the, jumping a few kind of like years now to today, you and I are now effectively spiritual Israel. It's not just for the Jews anymore. They weren't the only chosen people anymore. And this is highlighted by the most important thing in the 70-week prophecy. It's the event that happens in the middle of the week. AD 31, when Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross. Only 33 minutes so far. So there you have it. The 70-week prophecy. To which some of you may ask the question, that's nice, sure. We now can understand the reliability of the Bible. You know, it's clear. Now what? I mean, sure, Daniel was given this prophecy basically 120 years before it took place. But that's prophecy past for us. What does it mean for us today? And how does this set the stage for the rest of the series? Well, if we had the time, <laughs> the 70-week prophecy actually plays a large part in helping us understand the 2,300-day prophecy in Daniel 8 and verse 14. 
Some of you who have studied this are familiar probably with this passage. Unto 2,300 days shall the sanctuary be cleansed. You were probably curious on how I would present it um, with dates like 1844 and some of those things. I actually initially did plan to present it, put it all together, but it took too long, so I've decided to leave it. I wanted to instead focus just the second part of our prophecy past before we go into um, our prophecy present, and Dan will take that in a couple of weeks' time. I wanted to focus on the 70-week prophecy instead and how that applies to us. I mean, sure, it's prophecy past, but it was predicted, I mean, 120 years ago before it happened, it's already happened. Here's why I think it's vital when we study prophecy, when why we need to understand prophecy past, it's not just about what's coming. Ellen White, in Councils for the Church and a number of um, other compilation and publications, says this. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. We have nothing to fear for the future, Except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. We have nothing to fear unless we forget what's happened in the past. You see, Ellen White's counsel, <laughs> it's, it's actually common sense here. The Jews had 490 years with a 120-year head start to get, their, to get their act together. They had the heads up that, they, they, that all they need through generations. Daniel prayed as a leader. He prayed all he could. He essentially begged God forgiveness for forgiveness on behalf of his people. He knew that he wouldn't live to see the end of the prophecy, but he was worried that when his people would... Things would turn out exactly as the prophecy had predicted, that when the Messiah came, he would be cut off, and that it was his people who would turn him away and cut him off. Daniel was concerned that the Jews, instead of focusing on the Messiah, who's coming to bring change and transformation for the better, that they will be more concerned in upholding traditions and all the things that are earthly, you know, to hang on to the good old days, all the rituals, all the sacrifices and all the stuff they so clearly prided themselves on doing. There are incredible parallels, church. There are incredible parallels here with regards to the prophecy of the first coming of the Messiah and the prophecies of the second coming, which we will look at, which we've looked at briefly already, which Dan will cover further on October 25th. Next week, we have Pastor Michael Worker with us. Um, so, now, um, who, who's our guest speaker? But, but before we come to prophecies of the future, present and future, understanding what has happened is important. We have to ask ourselves the questions the Jews should have asked themselves upon learning about the 70-week prophecy. The, uh, the questions are effectively the same question. Are we ready for the Messiah to come? Do we know Him? Is He what we expect? Should we maybe change our expectations? Are we actually focused on the good news and the hope of the coming of Jesus? Because it's great news. How does that impact us? How can it impact us? Are there changes that we need to make in our lives now? I don't know about you, and, and in one sense, I feel like if you're watching this and you are not a believer, you're like, well, this guy is just going straight. He's making a few assumptions. Well, I think whether wherever you are at in your walk with God, I think you and I can agree that we are pretty much sick and tired of everything that's happening here in this world. We're pretty much sick and tired of everything that's happening in this world. But understanding prophecies past challenges us to look at prophecies in the future. How are we looking at the second coming? 
I wonder what would have happened if the Jews had asked themselves these questions as they studied the 70-week prophecy and coming to learn of the first coming of the, of the Messiah. You know, in one sense, as I said, this may apply to those of us who are long-time Christians. But I believe that the, my, my appeal is that we ask ourselves, regardless of where we're at in our walk with God, the prophecies past is a roadmap for the Jews. The prophecies present and stuff we'll cover is a roadmap for us moving forward. Are we treating that roadmap the same way the Jews treated the first roadmap? They had the heads up 120 years, a whole 490 years, but they chose to focus more on earthly traditions and their rights and their place on this earth. So what is our focus? You know, the Bible and the prophecies within offer so much more than what's happening on this earth. And we've looked at only one prophecy today. We can really dig deep into this as I believe that God is telling us before we look to the future, we need to be looking at prophecies past and learning from them. Church, our energies and time should be spent getting to know the Messiah who is to come. The Jews didn't. As a nation, they didn't. They didn't care to learn about him or get to know him. We can be different. We need to be different. Our emphasis should be on living as he lived so that when he does return, we'll be ready for the next level of transformation and change that he wants to bring us. We have this ultimate roadmap in front of us that we've looked at. It's not created by some politician or based on public health orders or whatever. It's a roadmap created by the creator of the universe. And even as we talk about what's happening around the world right now, and the laws and how it affects us. Yes, we need to talk about those things. Let us learn from how others have reacted to prophecies past. We need to remember that our emphasis and our focus is on Jesus and how we are to relate to each other as his children and how we are to reflect him even as we prepare for him to come again. So bringing it all together, bringing it all together, I'll finish by saying this, and I've said it before, knowing and studying and understanding prophecies is nice, but personally knowing who the prophecies are about, that is the most important thing. The roadmap, the ultimate roadmap, the real roadmap is laid out in front of us, and may our journey in studying the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, help bring us closer to the incredible God that He is, and of course, in experiencing His amazing love for us. Pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, sometimes we think of prophecies, we think of numbers, we think of all this, and it's like, oh, that's nice. But in it, Lord, we get a glimpse of the control that you have, the big picture that you've laid out. And your plans are not our plans. But Lord, even as we look at these prophecies, may we look at you first and foremost. Because ultimately, this is just but a roadmap that points back to you. As we continue to journey through this together and to see what the Bible has to tell us about what is coming, May you just lead us and guide us. May we learn from the past so that we have nothing to fear for the future as you lead us through it. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.